Some days it's harder to say, harder to do, to let you reign in our hearts. But God, be persistent with us. We want you to reign. Come and heal us, Lord Jesus. We are just here for you today to go out and minister to Cordoba in whatever way we can for you.
God, I pray that you just build each and every person up this morning and that no seed would fall on the plowed ground. We pray this all in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you sit down, greet one another. Shake a hand next to you. Kids four and under, you can head downstairs for nursery. seats um, before we jump into this morning's uh, service, this morning's word. Um, I feel led to just lead us in one more song. I've been doing this a little bit here and there, and it's definitely been a growth for me. I'm not the world's best singer by any means, um, so I'll turn my mic off like I normally do, but uh, I want you to sing this hymn with me. As the deer panted for the water so my soul longs after thee. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee. You to worship you. We would just desire to be close to you. And I think this isn't just a hymn, Lord, but the psalm that says, as a deer panteth for the water. Lord, if we're thirsty this morning, if we're spiritually thirsty this morning, God, I pray that each and every one of us would come to the wells of living water. God, that we would search your word. We'd examine it, God. And that the wells of living water would just even well up in our own lives and start to spring forth, God. And that the words that we look at this morning, that we want to be able to just contain it into our own lives, God, or into our own jars, or into our own vessels. But Lord, the, the living water would start to stream out of us, so it would gush out of us, so it would overflow out of us, God. 
so that other people, Lord, the thirsty people in our world, God, would know who our loving Father is. God, we hear so many times in this world that God isn't a just God, that He isn't a loving Father, He isn't a caring Dad. But Lord, we know who You are. And I pray this morning, God, that the things that we discuss about who You are to us as a Father, Lord, that we would believe them in full faith as truth. So that even when the world tries to throw us in, in every different direction to say that your, your God is a loving God, or your Father doesn't care about you, that we would stand firm in faith and know that we serve a God who loves us. And that we desire and we long to be in a relationship with you, Dad. We pray this all in your precious name, God. Amen. Amen. So this year we've been talking about faith. We've been talking about how even, like I said, a mustard size seed piece of faith does mighty things. And how we as Christians need to be living a life of faith. And how do we live this and work on this and, and live it out. And even when we have hardships and problems and trials, how do we stick with this um, foundational faith that we're called to have. And we're going to continue on with that this morning. As we talk about God the Father and how much He loves us and how it takes faith, it really does take faith. Like I said, even when our world tries to push us in these different attitudes or mindsets, it takes faith to really stand on the fact that God loves you, that He cares about you, that He desires to be in a relationship with you, that He loves you so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross to restore a relationship with you and Him. And the world can throw any other title they want to at it, but we can stand by faith in the fact that God loves us. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. So I labeled this morning's message, Listening to Dad. And as I've been preparing this week, I, I've realized that I'm in a season of life where my kid isn't listening to me. Has anybody ever been in that season before? Kids don't tend to listen. And Franklin's not, not listening out of rebellion. Uh, but it's because his attention's on other things. You know, hey, Franklin, don't do that. And he doesn't hear me because... He's, he's focused on something else. And I want to take this to a spiritual level for a second. Sometimes we don't listen to Dad because our attention's on other things. We're not trying to be rebellious and say, Okay, Father, you know, God, I, I know that this is much better of a way to walk, and I'm going to walk in this instead. But it's, hey, I'm not hearing from God at this moment. I wonder why. And it's because I'm so focused on all these other things rather than, Hey, God, what are you trying to tell me in this season that I'm in? So like Franklin, I think a lot of us might spiritually be in a spot and I'm not just saying now, but in, in a part of our life, we have been or we're in a spot where our attention starts to get put on other things rather than the Father's voice. And I want to bring up some of these things this morning that the Bible tells us the world tries to use to grab our attention and pull it away from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's highlight verse 4 together. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. It says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. So that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I'll read that again. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So even again, the enemy is the God of this, this, this world. Um, scripture says many times he's the prince of the air, and, and he's trying to do whatever he can to try to, to bring his agenda onto us. And... And scripture tells us that the unbelievers see this, they grasp it, and they, they, they tend to get to a spot where they can't even see the light of the gospel because of how thick the agenda of this world is. Um, and I, I think a lot of us have been in a spot before where we've tried to evangelize, or try to pray for someone, or try to talk to someone about Jesus, and, and they've pushed us away from it. Right? Anybody been in that spot before where we've been kind of pushed away when you try to share Jesus with someone? And this verse brings that into full context. They're blinded. The God of this world has blinded them so that they can't even see the light of the gospel. And we as Christians try to shine our light and we try to shine our bright. And we, and we kind of start to feel like it starts to get extinguished a little. When unbelievers tend to keep us off that distance. But we we're reminded that they are blinded. And, and the world wants us to get pulled into that. So if unbelievers are blinded because of the God of this age or the God of this world is causing that. How much more could we maybe be deceived into that mindset or that agenda? So the first thing I want to bring up this morning is just a reminder that, that the world wants to grab our attention and pull it somewhere else and completely blind us 
from the light of the gospel. Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about it in Romans as well. So he brings it forth to the church of Rome, uh, Romans 8, verses 5 through 8. A, a scripture that we probably know a little bit better. It says this, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. I'll read that again. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. So if you're living in the sinful nature, where is your mind? Towards those things, right? That's what scripture tells us. And then he goes on. He says this, But those who live accordance, in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So if we're living according to the Spirit, where's our mind set? On what the Spirit desires. He goes on and continues with this. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. So we get some pretty lengthy, weighty words here. It says this again, the sinful mind, and where's the sinful mind at? On sinful things, right? The fleshly desires, the sinful mind is hostile to God. Now, how many people want to say that's a characteristic I would like in my Christian walk? I want to be hostile to God. Anybody? No. But it says this, if you are living by the flesh, your, your flesh is desiring your fleshly desires rather than saying, I want to submit to the will of God. I want to submit to the Holy Spirit. I want to, I want to long to be in a relationship with the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Be in step with the Spirit. He says, if your mind is set on sinful things, you become hostile to God. He goes on and he, he hits us even harder. He says, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. If you're, again, if your attention is on your fleshly desires, or this world's agenda, or, or, or maybe it's just, hey, my friends have a really good opportunity, and it seems like it's the right thing to do. We kind of talked about it this morning at Sunday school. Um, the, the right thing to do. But if it's not according to God's law, God's word, we're going to start to get to that spot where we're hostile to God. We're going to rather our own decisions, our own behavior, rather than what God wants for us. So it says, um, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And then he gets on a little bit further here at the end of verse 8. Those controlled by the sinful nature, what? Cannot please God. That's, that's brutal. That's a punch right to the gut, right? If you're living to the sinful desire, what? You can't please God. And so this world's agenda, the things that, wants, that, that, the, that the enemy wants us to be hooked into and grabbed onto and, and, and to go with the flow of everyone else, those things, again, lead us to fleshly desires. And then what? We're not pleasing God. Now, if we're in a relationship with our, our earthly fathers, a, a biological dad, or maybe it's not even your biological dad, but, but there's a human father figure in your life, that whether it's a spiritual dad or just someone that's come along you, alongside you in a season of life that you, you've been going through, just, just really been kind of like a father figure. Um, if, if we kind of put this into that context, the same, the spiritual context and the physical context for a second. And we think about the fact, if, if that person that's a father figure to us is telling us good things, right? He's mentoring us and encouraging us and spurring us on and, and doing the things that he needs to do to try to get us back to a spot where we need to be. Are, are we, are we going to listen to that? We should, right? If the father figure in our life, again, whether it's a biological dad or a spiritual dad, if he's trying to encourage us and, and, and tell us what's right and, and to lead us into a way we're supposed to be walking into, we want to listen to that, yes? Yeah. This is Marlene and I. Who are your mentors, church? <laughs> Hopefully they're good mentors. If not, you should probably find some new ones. We want to listen to that, those things, right? It's the same way in our spiritual context. God knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. One of the things that I, I just, I, I love it. I love it when, when someone comes to me about Old Testament and says, Pastor, you know, why are we following all these things that the Old Testament followed? Like, why are we not eating these animals and eating these animals and all these things? Like, come on, it, it's the law, right? But, but realistically, you know why God made that law? Because he knew our bodies. He formed us. He knew what was healthy for us. He knew what our bodies needed and didn't need. And he loved us enough to say, hey, I don't want you to do these things that are healthy for you. Dad, Dad loved us so much that he says, I know you, I know what's good for you, I'm setting these laws in a place, not because I want to control you, but because I love you and I know what you need. The same way with the spiritual context. If we want our attention to be towards God, 
even if it seems a little bit like it's, it's harsh or distasteful to us because our fleshly desires contradict that, we've still got to remember that we have a dad in heaven who loves us unconditionally. So the world tries to pull us away from this and, and tries to get our attention on other things like you can do this yourself or, or it's better if you do it this way or every time it happens this way, this is the result that comes out of it. But again, we as children of God need to be doing what? Listening to dad. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Are you a child of God? Who's that? Who, who, what does that mean? Who, who's your dad then? God. If you're a child of God, who's your dad? God. God. Just Kayla knows it. Come on, church, wake up. God the Father, right? If I claim to be a child of God, that means I know who dad is. Church, we've got to live a life where we understand and know who dad is. Romans 12, verse 2, a, a more popular scripture here. Romans 12, verse 2, if you want to turn there with me as well. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. So again, we see this world tries to grab our attention and bring it somewhere else. And there's a, a very real pressure to conform to this world, isn't there? There is. Everything's being thrown at us so much that, that there's a pressure to fit into a box or to be squeezed into a mold on many different levels of our life. Whether it's in finances, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in our job, or even our status as a person, we, we, we tend to be squeezed into all these molds that the world tries to throw at us. That we as Christians need to resist that tendency to imitate what the world, what the world wants us to imitate. Anybody ever heard the saying, if it looks like a duck and acts like a duck and walks like a duck, it must be a duck. Now let me ask you a question. If you look like God and act like God and talk like God and do what God says, what might you be? A Christian. Right? Yeah. But if you're acting like the world and talking like the world and doing what the world does, what might you be? Living by your fleshly desires. Right? So do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, it says. The reason we got to resist this is because... Um, we're conforming to the world system that's present, and it, it's, it's ran by Satan, like we said. Scripture says that this world is ran by Satan. He's the prince of the air, and he wants us to be conforming to the worldly patterns. And like we just read a second ago, this is hostile to God and his people. I think I've got a slide for this, uh, Andrew, if you want to throw that up there. Some of the reasons why we should not conform uh, to the to the world system or to the patterns. How does it say again? Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Why should we not do that? The scripture tells us it's evil, right? Mm -hmm. The enemy's plans are not prosperous for you. They're not to bless you. They're not to give you life and life abundantly. They're not truth. So what is it? Evil. That's what scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that it's it's under Satan's rule. It tells us, again, it's hostile to God and to God's people. Scripture tells us also it's built on human wisdom and values and an unbiblical uh, worldview. It's full of spiritual darkness, deception, and seduction. These are the things that the world wants to try to grab us with, church. And that's not what the Father wants us to be living in. So we see all these things that try to conform us. So instead of conforming, we need to continually be renewed and transformed to God's way of thinking, like this says here in Romans 12, 2. To trans have your minds transformed continually. It just can't be a one-time thing, right? Has anybody fallen off the bus a couple times? <laughs> yeah? You, you think you've got it all figured out, and then there's a curveball that comes along, and oh, man, I got tempted again, right? Continually being transformed. Having our minds renewed to that of Christ. It's, it's again, that all, the whole thing we're talking about this morning, as we spend time reading and meditating on his word and getting to know him and, and understanding, I need to renew and have my mind transformed. It brings us back to a spot where we have to do what? Listen to God, right? If I'm saying the world's coming at me with all these different angles, and I'm listening to what the world's trying to promote to me, but I say, wait a second, the scripture tells me I can have a renewed mind and a transformed mind. Where does it get me? It gets me back to a spot of understanding. I need to listen to God. Amen? I need to listen to God. And just like the simple physical illustration I used, where my kid is having a hard time listening to me, it's again because his attention is on other things. 
And church, that's where we get to in life sometimes. Our attention is on all these other things that we forget to just listen to God. So we need to ask Him to renew and transform our minds so that we no longer will be having our attention on other things, but having it on Him. Luke chapter 6, if you want to turn there with me as well. Luke 6, starting at verse 46 together. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. It says this, and this is a, a parable we hear in others, another gospel in, in Matthew and Mark. Luke says it a little bit differently, and I want to point that out this morning. Luke 6, verse 46. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not, uh, and do, not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my word and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck the house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed, and destruction was complete. But I want to hone in here on verses 46 and 47. He talks to them, and he says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I want to ask you that question this morning, church. Do you call out to God as your father, but not understand that he is asking things of you? Do you call him dad, but not have a relationship with him like he is your dad? And that's where these, these people are. They're saying, Lord, 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 tell us, tell us, tell us these things. He says, you're not even doing what I'm saying. How can you call me Lord? How could you say you're my servant if you're not doing the things I'm asking you to do as a servant? And he goes on to verse 47, and he says this, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. Who hears my words and what? Puts them into practice. And the things I'm going to talk about this morning, the words that we're going to hit on this morning, aren't words of, hey, these are things you need to go and do. Okay? I'm not going to bring you a long list of, hey, this is what Dad wants you to do. But the list I'm going to bring you at the end of the service is the list of things that God says about you. It's not really a whole, okay, this is what God's saying of me. i got to put this into practice in a way. But it is in a way uh, where we have to hear the things that God says to us and put them into practice in a way that we understand that God truly does say these things about us. And that takes faith sometimes, like we've been saying. We're going to get to that here in a second. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. But these words that I'm going to show you, he says, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and here's my words and puts them into practice says that's like building your house on a good foundation so we talked about different ways that the world tries to grab our attention but i want to switch gears here for a second and ask the question how do we listen to god how do we listen to him anyone ever heard the verse children obey your parents nobody wait a second are you guys listening to pastor Anybody ever heard the verse, children obey your parents? And just the kids are raising their hands. Come on, parents. You should be listening too. How many people have ever heard of the verse, children obey your parents? All right, now we're starting to see some hands get raised. Now let me throw you a curveball this morning, okay? We all know that verse says, hey, kids, you better listen to mom and dad. Now, I'm going to throw the curveball. Hey, church, kids, children of God, obey dad. Right? As earthly kids should obey their earthly fathers, why shouldn't the verse also look in a way that we say, hey, spiritual children obey spiritual dad, right? Yes? Curveball. Just like we're saying to our kids, hey, you guys got to obey me. Uh, I'm going to look you guys in the face this morning too and say, hey, guys, got to obey dad. Father God. John 10, verses 22 through 30. If you want to turn there, okay, John chapter 10. Starting together in verse 22. It says this, John 10, verse 22. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus was in the temple area, walking in Solomon's colonnade. And the Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I 
and the Father of one. And so we see this, they're asking these questions, what, if you're really the, the Christ, if you're really the Messiah, why don't you show us, and, and how long are you going to keep us in suspense, and just let us know that you're Jesus. And he tells them, this whole time I've been telling you, right? Anybody read the Gospels? There's time and time again where a miracle after miracle got performed, and Jesus never said, oh, look at me. What would he say? I'm going to point back to Father. God gets the glory out of this, Right? And as people came to him and got to know him and, and understand that he wasn't the Messiah, there was other people that were saying, come on, we're ready, tell us. Just tell us plainly. And he says this very profound thing there at the end of verse 26 and the beginning of verse 27 where he says this again. He says, but you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now, you might have a hard time understanding this because you say, well, Pastor, I'm not a sheep. Let me, let me change a word here for a second. And I don't think this is going to completely disrupt the Bible, but my children know my voice. Right? My children know my voice. My children follow me. He says this in verse 28. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. Again, what does he point the credit to? Dad. My father has given them to me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I am, I am the father of one. But my sheep know my voice. And I know them and they follow me. Church, we've got to get to a spot where we're listening to dad so much that, that, that we understand when he's talking to us. That we understand when the world's trying to talk to us and we say, wait a second, that's not the voice of that. Anybody ever, maybe you have to really pull back in your memory bank here, but, but when you were growing up, or maybe it's been later in life, was there ever a time when you could close your dad, you close your eyes, and if your dad was talking to you, you would know his voice? Yeah. Maybe there's a lot of people talking around, but even if you close your eyes, you knew, you knew who who that. Yeah. Same spiritual context here. Even if we feel like God's not present, which He is, Scripture tells us time and time again He is, we can know what His voice is. Amen? Even if all the, these worldly influences and the enemy and all these other things try to, try to tell us what to do, we can still say, wait a second, I know Dad's voice. That's not His voice. And you might be asking questions, questions this morning, how do I know what Dad's voice is? If it lines up with this, it's coming from God. If it's not being manipulated and kind of brought around and, and, and tried to have an agenda or spin on it, but it is the true, authentic Word of God, and it lines up with what God says, you might be listening to the right voice. Amen? We've got to know the Word of God. We've got to meditate on it. We've got to listen to what the Word of God is and apply it to our lives so that we know what God's telling us to do. John 15, let's jump a couple of chapters ahead here to the John chapter 15. He says this starting in verse 1. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And apart from me, he can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than he who lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends, for everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, 
and then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Was there a reoccurring word that came up a lot of times in that, that portion of scripture? Maybe like abide. Anybody have abide in their, in, their, in their Bible? Did it come up a few times? Maybe the word remain? Anybody see the word remain a few times in there? I want to break this out here for a second. Abide and abiding in Christ means believing and trusting and welcoming Christ in our lives. I believe you, God. As we say I'm abiding in Christ or I'm remaining in Christ, it's saying that even though things might not go my way, I'm still believing that God knows what's best for my life. Amen? I'm still welcoming Christ to make those decisions for me rather than trying to take the mantle myself. I'm trusting in you, Dad, because you know what's best for me rather than me trying to do it alone. Right? He says, abide in me. It is uh, fully attaching ourselves to God and drawing our necessary life force from Him. Has anybody ever seen grafting before in a, in a plant? Where, where something's not living the way it should and you can graft it into another plant so it starts producing the life it needs to produce? If we take again that to a spiritual sense this morning, if you're not producing life, God says, guess what? Just remain in me, abide in me, graft your life with me. And what? Life and life abundantly. Abundantly, right? He says, not only are you going to receive life, what else? What was this whole little portion of scripture about? You're going to start seeing fruit, right? Right? Come on, church, what do you got? I know it's sunny outside. I know we're just longing to be out there. But every time I see someone's eyes roll and start to fall asleep, I'm going to add five minutes to say, I'm, just, I'm kidding. We're going to start to see fruit in our lives, right? If we graft our lives to, the, to, to Christ and abide in Him and remain in Him, what's going to happen? Fruit, right? And the Father says, and Jesus says about the Father, He says, He wants and longs for us to have these fruit, fruit that will last. And then he says, when these fruit are in your life, the end of verse 16, then the Father will give you whatever you ask for my name. And this is my command, love each other. Another verse I want to highlight here, and I kind of just throwing it in there if you're taking notes. Verses 12 and 13, my command is this, love each other. Um, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. How are we going to be able to love each other as Christ has loved us if we don't understand Christ's love for us? Right? He doesn't just say, hey, Judy, love these people the way that you want to love them. Or Terry, man, you really know how to love those people. Just love them. How does God tell us to love? The same way he loves us. Right? So how do we know how to love others? We have to experience and understand God's love for us. Right? And that's where I want us to start to head towards in a, in a direction here. Um, just a little bit more here on the word abide. Uh, the Greek word for abide is meno. And it means to completely remain in something. So if we were to have something constantly be remaining. So if I were to put, we put these seeds in this vase this morning. And if we were to say, we're not going to touch this vase ever again. We're going to just let those seeds stay there. What's going to happen? They're going to stay there, right? The same with, with this word mano, which means I'm keeping my life with God. Whatever the world tries to do, I, I'm still staying there. Whatever my friends try to tell me, I'm still staying here. Even if my spouse or my children or someone else tries to say something and throw me off, I'm staying with God. I'm abiding in Him. I'm remaining in Him. And this is a continual thing. It's something we have to do daily. It's not just something that happened once and it's done. We have to continually say, I'm going to stay by God and depend on Him no matter what life throws my way. I'm going to continually to understand the fact that Christ loves me. Romans chapter 10, if you want to turn there with me this morning as well. Romans 10, starting together in verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17, it says this. It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did, you, did they not hear? And of course they did. Their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation, and I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly said as well, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands. 
who are disobedient and obstinate people. Verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So it starts with what? Listening, right? We've got to listen. And he says there's times in Scripture where the, the, the people of God were given an opportunity to listen, and they chose not to listen. And verse 21 is, is, is a very, again, another gut punch for us. If we really let this seek in this morning, I want you to close your eyes as I, as I read this verse one more time. Verse 21. But concerning Israel, he says, this is God's people. This is the children of God. He says, concerning Israel, all day long I've held up my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Now open your minds. Open your eyes. Open your minds, too. Is that where you want to be? Where God says, yeah, I love my children, but they're disobedient. They're obstinate. I hold my hand out to them all day long, and they don't take what I'm trying to give to them. That should, <laughs> that should affect us, church. We can get to a spot where we're so leaning on our own understanding that we become disobedient and obstinate to God. So this morning, I want to, again, just keep pushing through on this. We need to be in prayer. We need to be reading the Bible. We need to be meditating on the Word of God. We need to be longing for a relationship with Dad so that we don't get to a spot where we're being disobedient and just off the rails in our Christian walks. That our attention won't be grabbed on or, or holding on to other things, but instead, like the hymn we sang at the, more, at the beginning of the service, that we would be longing and desiring for a relationship with our Creator. That we would be desiring to listen to Dad. That we would be desiring to, to spend time in His Word. And I, and I had an illustration that I wanted to share this morning. I didn't get all the components put together. But I think we can all understand if I just verbalize it this morning, okay? Has anybody ever had tea before? Anybody had tea? Has anybody ever made tea before? Okay. So if you were to dip that tea bag into your water really quick and pull it out, what would happen? Nothing much, right? But if you were to dip it in again for a couple seconds and pull it out, what might start to happen? You might just see a little bit of change happening, right? And then if you were to dip it in again for a little bit longer and hold it in there for a little bit longer and pull it out, what's going to start to happen? It's going to get a little more darker, right? And then if I were to say, okay, you know what, I'm just going to dip it in and leave it there and let it steep for five minutes like it's supposed to, what's going to happen? It's going to be exactly what it's supposed to be, right? That's us. As we meditate on God's word, a lot of times we sit, let me ask you a question this morning. This is not in my notes. How many people own a Bible? How many people say I own multiple Bibles? You go into my house, I got a few Bibles here and there. How many people have, have, a, have an app on your phone for the Bible? Does it have one translation or a lot of translations? A lot? Yet, reading the word of God is one of the hardest things for us to do. We all have Bibles. They're, they're so accessible that the things that we make our, take our phone calls on and texts and all that stuff to talk with other people, we have a hard time just sitting down and listening to that. And just like that tea bag, as we start to meditate on the Word, if we dip it in a little bit and start to see, hey, things are starting to change, I want to dip it in again. Hey, I'm going to read my word of, of the Word of God this week, and now I feel a little bit more connected with Jesus. I want to do that again tomorrow. And as we start to do that, and that tea starts to, to in the, the spiritual sense, is that we start to see this change happening in our minds and in our lives and the way we associate with other people. We start to see that change happening. We're going to desire and long for more and more of this. I just think it's very coincidental and crazy or ironic, I guess the word is ironic, that we have literally Bibles at our fingertips. And it's probably the best way for us to grow and mature. Right? Honestly, reading our word is probably the best way for us to grow mature. If we want to grow plants and, and have them mature into what we want them to be, we give them fertilizer and water and, and make sure that they're being fed and watered, right? All we need is to read the word of God and long for a relationship with Him. It's so accessible and it's right at our fingertips yet, and it's the easiest way for us to grow that we have a hard time even picking it up. And if we, again, put this into a physical... I know I'm bringing this back and forth with spiritual and physical, but, but if we put this into a physical setting again, and if I, as a kid, would only spend time with my dad once a week, what kind of relationship would I have with him? 
Okay, maybe let's take a step further back. Maybe we've only read our Bible once this month. If I were to talk to Dad once a month, how would my relationship with him be like? Has anybody ever had a New Year's resolution to read more of the Bible? Anybody? You start in Genesis, then you get to Exodus, then you get to oh, there it goes. And so and so, we got so and so and so and so, we got so and so and so and so, we got so and so and anything. <laughs> I don't think I want to read this anymore. And then don't even get to the other parts, and you start to see other more gory and extremely just crazy stuff. Well, I don't know anymore. But it's right there in front of us. And God says, this is my written word to you. This, it, the scripture tells us it's God breathed. This is my voice. And I want to talk to you more than once a month. I want to talk to you more than once a week. Once every other day. I want to talk to you daily. And I think of, of Adam and Eve as they spent time in that garden. God walked with them what? Daily. I'm going to ask you a question, church. I don't want hands raised or not. Do you walk with Dad daily? Do you desire to be in a relationship with him daily? It's not just, man, yeah, I really want to be in a relationship with God daily, but I desire, I, I thirst for, I hunger to be with God daily. And, and as we kind of bring this to, the, to a close, and we remind ourselves of these things, like all scriptures, God breath, breathes, and uh, he says this also in Scripture, So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth, that shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the things that which I sent it to. He says, I want to talk to you guys. And as we come to a close, I've got a video that I want to put up, and then I've got a couple last things I want to share. But, but as we watch this video, I, I want you to really understand, you might have seen this video before, it's an old one, it's been around for at least a decade. But, but um, if you want to, before we get to that, I want you to just for a second, before we watch this video, if you want to press pause, I'm really quick there, Andrea. Before we watch this video, I want to remind you, if you click the slide before it, it'll stop it. My turn. Maybe not. If you click the slide ahead of it, it'll stop it. There you go. Thanks. Before we watch this video, I just want to remind you, you are a child of God. Amen? Amen. Church, get excited. You are a child of God. So as we watch this video, I want you to understand, it might take some faith for you this morning to say, man, I really believe that. Everything that he brings up in this video are scriptural. You'll see the verse come alongside of it. But, but it might take faith for some of you this morning to say, man, I really believe that that's the dad that I have. And as we watch this, I want you to get to a spot where you say, man, that does, that does define our relationship with God. I do believe that God wants to have that kind of relationship with me. I do believe that God says these things about me. And because, again, that's, that's where we want to be. We want to be in a spot that we believe the Word of God. How many people believe the Word of God this morning? Just half the church. Church, how many people believe the Word of God? Right? So these things He says about you, He means it. Again, it's not God's audible voice. It's somebody telling what Scripture says. But the things that come up in this video, God means it about you. And I want you to watch this with me as we start to come to a close. expression of love and it 
is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your mother. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand. Your future is always fulfilled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you of all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your father, and I love you even as I love my son Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I may be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you will receive me, and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father, and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? gives us just a brief description of what scripture says that dad says about us and I want to come through with a, a few more things as we come to a close here and I think I've got slides for these two Andrew if you want to put this up there as well what does God say about us he says you're a child of God he says you're adopted in the sonship he says you're accepted he says you're uh, the fullness of Christ he says you're raised with Christ you're one with Christ you're free from condemnation you're created in His image. You're free from the bondage of sin. You're redeemed. He's given grace upon grace to you. He's appointed you. He set you apart. He says that you're the body of Christ. He says you're chosen, a royal priesthood, that you're holy. He says you're my special possession. He says you're beloved. He says you're the righteousness of God. He says he's called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. That you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. That you're bought with the price. That you are a new creation. You're his workmanship. He says you're a friend of mine. He says you're more than conquerors. He says I sing over you and delight in you. Lamentation says that he collects all your tears in a bottle. He says every tear that you cry, I collect in a bottle because I care for you. He says he knows the desires of your heart. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Somebody might say, there's not many anymore, but he knows the number of hairs on your head. He calls you mine. And he so loves you. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. He sent a son for you. 
So church, as we come to a close, I just want you to stand for a moment. This list of things that I listed this morning, and, and, and even the things in the video, they're all true. God loves you. He says, because I loved you, now I want you to love others. And that's a big step. The, the first step of faith is recognizing that this is truth. If you want to close your eyes for a second. If you're going through a moment in life where you feel like you're a mistake, God says you're not a mistake. If you're going through a time in life where you feel like your life is just getting chaotic and things are falling apart and you might be losing friendships or loved ones or, or, or job or finances, God says, I'm going to provide for you. If you feel like you're going through the ringer of life and no one can understand the things that you're going through, God says, I care. He says, you're my child. And I want you to talk to me about it. Whatever you're going through in life, and whatever the enemy tries to throw at you, whatever this world tries to throw at you, church, I want you to walk away from this service this morning knowing and understanding that this list of things that God says about you is a true list. And even if this world tries to misrepresent our God and tries to throw all this junk at us, church, you are children of God. Stand on that foundation. You are a child of God. And no matter what your relationship was like with your father and however he might have treated you as a child, that is not the relationship that God has towards you. If it was a loving, wonderful, awesome relationship, God says, I'm going to love you even more than that. I long to be with you even more than that. And if you had a rough childhood with a rough dead father, God says, don't let those things misinterpret what I have for you. I love you. I care for you. I'm going to provide for you. I long to be close to you. If you're going through hardships, I'm going to carry you through. I'm going to be with you till the end. And nothing, he says, nothing will separate us from the love that God has for us. And church, I want to just again say this this morning. I want every person in this sanctuary this morning to be able to walk out of here and fully understand that God the Father loves you. God loves you. And once we start understanding that, church, once we start understanding that we're not a mistake, that we're not being not looked out for, that we start understanding that someone's rooting for us because He loves us. Once we start understanding that God loves us, we're then going to be able to show this world the love that they're longing for. It's not going to be the love that this world tries to promote. It's going to be the Father's love for His children. And as we think of all the unbelievers in our life, I want us to think about this. God the Father knit them together in their mother's womb, just as He knit us together in our mother's womb. And John 3.16 is not just for the church. He says again, For God so loved the world. So church, once we understand that God loves us and we start letting that love pour out of us into the people that we come in contact with, they're going to start to see a love that is unlike any other love they've felt before. And we get to be a part of that. When Jesus left his disciples and said, you're going to do greater things, it wasn't that we would be doing greater miracles than Christ. Or wasn't that we'd be able to, to, to do all these things and never get exhausted because Jesus got exhausted. It was the fact that we together could just love on people the same way God loved us. And that love is greater. Church, that love is greater than the love that this world promotes. That is very self-seeking. Self-desiring. Self-promoting. It's not possessional. 
We can't trap it in a box. The love that God has for this world is beyond our comprehension. And we get to be vessels as we share that love with the people we come in contact with. Worship team, if you want to come on up, I still want you to keep your eyes closed. I want to read one last verse here. The worship team, come on up. 1 John 1, 1 through 3, it says this, That which was from the beginning, which we heard, and which we have seen with our eyes, which, we, uh, which he saved, which he saved, and looked at with our hands, uh, and have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us in our fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So just as he brings out in his first couple of verses of 1 John, that is literally the love chapter, almost the love chapter of the Bible. He says, because of the Father's love, we want to continue to proclaim God's love to others. So church, as we sing this last song, I just want you to keep your eyes closed. It's a song we all know. I want you to keep your eyes closed. I just want you to spend a little bit of time here while we sing a song. And just ask God, Lord, is there someone in my life that I need to show the Father's love to? Maybe it's my spouse. Maybe it's my children. Maybe it's a coworker, a friend, a neighbor that I've never reached out to. Lord, Holy Spirit, quicken to my mind someone, Lord, that I need to love the same way the Father loves me. And after saying this last song, I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit, show me, show me someone this week that I can share God's love with because He loves them just as much as He loves me.
that that name or that face or that person, God, that you would give us a divine appointment this week to be able to restore a relationship, that person's relationship is restored. But God, that you would help us love that person the same way that you love us. And lastly, God, I pray that each and every person here this morning, whether they're under the age of five, or they're over the age of 80, Lord, or anywhere in between, God, I pray that each and every person that walks out of the sanctuary would truly believe and know and understand that you love them. That you are their father. And that they are your son or your daughter. Help us grasp that this week, Lord. And I pray that we would just listen to you, Dad. That we would listen to you. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Hey, just a reminder, there's a time of fellowship downstairs. If you want to head downstairs, you've got some finger foods. Otherwise, if you have a key to the church, I want to remind you, we're going to have a quick, quick meeting. So please stick around, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that together here really quick.